Hello and welcome to Glasgow Science Centre's Curious About Innovation Digital Science Festival. My name is Nina and I'm the Planetarium Coordinator here at Glasgow Science Centre. Thanks to the support of the David Elder Request and the University of Strathclyde, I'm delighted to be joined today by Naomi Rogurney, who is a PhD student at the University of Leicester studying the atmospheres of the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. She's going to give us a short talk and then after her talk, we're going to be opening the floor to your questions. Um, so if you've got any questions for Naomi about her work or career uh, and about the Webb Space Telescope she's going to be using in her research, just pop that question into the YouTube comments or you can send it over to Twitter at GSC1. Um, we'll start the talk now, so get comfortable and we'll see you back here shortly. Hello everyone, I'm really excited and honoured to be doing the David Elder Lecture today. So my name is Naomi Rogani and I am a PhD student at the University of Leicester. So my work uses the uh, space telescopes to look at the ice giants Uranus and Neptune. And today I'm going to talk about the newest and most ambitious space telescope ever made, the James Webb Space Telescope, and how it's going to change our understanding of our solar system when it launches later this year. The James Webb Space Telescope is an orbiting infrared observatory. It has a 6.5 meter primary mirror made of 18 separate movable segments, four scientific instruments housed in the back of the mirror, a tennis court sized five layer sun shield, and it's gonna be stuffed into a rocket, launched into space and be able to slowly unfold itself as it approaches its home at the L2 Lagrangian point. Hopefully within the next 15 minutes, you'll learn uh, what everything I just said means. So it's big, it's complicated, and it's also the future of astronomy. It's gonna be the premier observatory of the next decade, serving thousands of astronomers worldwide. Building it has already been an international collaboration between NASA in the USA, the European Space Agency, uh, including the UK, and the Canadian Space Agency. So the main job of any telescope is to look at distant objects. It gathers light from those objects and focuses it either into your eye, like a telescope you would have at home, or into an instrument or multiple instruments if it's bigger, like the web. So web is unique because it's the first ever space telescope with movable mirror segments. So each one of those golden hexagons can be moved independently and they need to be movable so we can fold the telescope up for launch because it's so big. And each segment can be moved independently to manually focus the light into the central detector and back into those instruments so we can do science with them. So the easiest way to explain Webb is to directly compare it to the world's favourite space telescope, the Hubble Space Telescope. So Hubble was launched in 1990 and it celebrated 30 years uh, in April of last year in 2020. So the picture here that you can see below me is uh, of the deployment of, this, of it in the Space Shuttle Discovery. And it's had 1.3 million observations since its launch in 1990. And it's produced beautiful images. Uh, some examples can be seen here of amazing groundbreaking solar system science. It's observed everything from Mars all the way out to Neptune, plus uh, moons and even more. So imagine what Webb can do with even better technology. So how is Webb better than Hubble? The telescope's bigger always means better. So the animation here shows the relative size of Webb on the left and Hubble on the right. The larger mirror of Webb, which is 6.5 metres, uh, has more collecting area for light, so it can look at dimmer, smaller, colder and more distant objects than its predecessor, Hubble. You can even see a person there for scale, so these, both of these machines are huge. Another major difference is that Webb is in the infrared rather than the visible. Visible light is what we see with our own eyes, and it's what Hubble mostly sees. When we split light up using a prism into a rainbow, 
Towards the red end, we stop being able to see the light and start being able to feel it as heat. And Webb looks at heat like we look at light. And that's useful for scientists for many reasons. So in the video, you can see a nebula, lots of dust and gas in space. First, we see it invisible, then in the infrared. We can look through those, that cold dust and see the hot stars forming inside, which is really exciting for scientists. And for solar system, we can also use this to look beneath clouds of planets and see what's happening underneath, like those two images of Jupiter that you see there. The visible on the left, and we can see beneath those clouds to the heat underneath on the right. And because we're looking at heat in the infrared, we need to keep the telescope itself as cold as possible. So Earth is warm, so we need to go much further away than Hubble to stay away from the heat of Earth. Uh, and Hubble is in a very close orbit, it's only 570 kilometers away. And we need to go to somewhere called the L2 Lagrangian point, and that's 1.5 million kilometers away. A Lagrangian point is just a gravity well. It's where a spacecraft can hover and stay in constant communication with Earth as it travels around the sun with us. And the need to keep this telescope cold is also the reason why we have uh, these huge tennis court sized five layer uh, sun shield. And that needs to always be facing the sun to protect the instruments from the heat of the sun. So Webb was made to do lots of different science. It had has four major science themes. First light, which looks back over 13.5 billion years to see the first stars and galaxies forming in the early universe. Galaxies to help us to understand galaxy, how galaxies assemble over billions of years. To see through dust, to look at where stars and planetary systems are being born and planetary systems like our own solar system. And our own solar system is the topic that I'll be talking about today. So what in the solar system is Webb going to be able to look at? Well, it's gonna be able to observe everything from Mars out because it can't look towards our sun, remember? So it can look at planets, moons, asteroids, Kuiper belt objects, comets, uh, and it's more difficult than it sounds. Everything in the solar system is really bright and moving really fast compared to galaxies and stars in the distance. Uh, so engineers had to overcome these obstacles to make solar system science possible. So let's start with our closest neighbor, Mars. Uh, it's one of the fastest objects that Webb can track. It's also one of the brightest because uh, it's so close to us. And we're able to observe when it's at its dimmest and we can make global maps of Mars like the one shown here on the right and uh, shows what it's made of and what the atmosphere is like and it can answer big questions like what happened to make the ancient lakes oceans and rivers on mars dry up could mars have ever hosted life uh, and was it in the distant or recent past when was it what causes martian global sandstorms like the one observed in 2018 and that's especially important if humans are to ever visit uh, we don't want to lose another matt damon <laughs> So further out in the solar system are my favorite planets, the giant planets, Jupiter, Saturn, Uranus, Neptune. Uh, because we're looking in the infrared, we can look through their atmospheres and see what they're made of. We can see what the weather is like and why it's like that. Uh, we can even do things like target storms, so like Jupiter's great red spot and look at what's happening there. We can look at the rings of, of the giant planets. And uh, all these images here come from huge, uh, a huge ground-based telescope based in Chile called the Very Large Telescope or the VLT. And it's not just uh, planets, but also their moons too that we can look at. Uh, moons are some of the most interesting bodies in the solar system. Uh, moons like Europa and Enceladus here um, are cold, but they likely have deep ocean worlds. Uh, and these uh, subsurface oceans may contain life. And moons like Titan, Titan is the only body in the solar system where there are rivers, lakes and oceans like on Earth, but they're made of methane instead of water. So there may also be life in places like Titan, but it wouldn't be as we know it on Earth. Asteroids and comets are of huge scientific interest. We can also look at these. The, they're the leftovers from the formation of the solar system. Asteroids and near-Earth objects like Eros are faint, 
they're very small and very cold so they're hard to observe but Webb can look at them and they contain answers to some of our biggest questions and help solve the mysteries of the early solar system and planet formation maybe these bodies even brought life to earth and, and asteroids are mostly in the asteroid belt between Mars and Jupiter, but Kuiper belt objects are beyond Neptune, sometimes called trans-Neptunian objects, um, and they're in something called the Kuiper belt. Um, and they're much colder, they're further away, and even harder to observe than asteroids, but uh, Webb is going to be able to look at all of them. And that includes Pluto, uh, which is a Kuiper belt object, and also one of the largest moons of Neptune, Triton, which they think is also a captured Kuiper belt object. So now we know what the web can do a little bit about me. Uh, so I did my four year integrated masters in physics with astrophysics at the University of Leicester. I took a break for five years and then I went on to do my PhD at the University of Leicester and currently I'm in my final year. So my thesis is looking at the atmospheres of the ice giants Uranus and Neptune, and that's why I'm now involved with Webb, because the ice giants are some of the most exciting solar system targets. And that's because they are so cold and distant that they're especially difficult to look at from Earth. And we know very little about them because we have only visited them once using uh, Voyager 2 back in the 1980s. So my research helps to find questions uh, to the answers uh, we want to, uh, what we want to answer with Webb. So my research uses uh, the Spitzer Space Telescope. And Spitzer was launched in the same generation of telescopes as Hubble in 2003, and it was decommissioned January last year. It was in an Earth trailing orbit, so it's following us around the sun, and it was pretty small. The mirror was less than a meter across, about 0.8 meters, uh, but it was uh, an infrared telescope like Webb, so similar. And because the telescope is so small, it means we don't get any pictures of the ice giants when we use it. We get spectra. So spectra like this. This is an example from Uranus in December 2007. And this is the kind of data that I work with. And the bumps and troughs in these lines tell you what the atmosphere is made of. It can tell you what temperature it is at different heights. And it can sometimes also tell you how the atmosphere is moving. So it is useful to us. Uh, so Webb is a big upgrade from Spitzer. Uh, currently, we frequently have to choose between finding out what something is made of and what something looks like. So for example, uh, Uranus here, uh, we either have information like with Spitzer Space Telescope, we look at the spectra, or we can have images uh, like ground-based telescopes like the VLT we saw in uh, Chile. And the exciting part of Webb is that we can now have both. So Webb can have both information and image uh, taken together. And that's in something called a spaxel. So spectra is the, the image at the top, just lines, and uh, the pixels in the picture from the VLT. So imagine each pixel in that picture will have a, a spectra attached to it. And that means that each pixel would be a spaxel, which is extremely cool. And it, scientists are extremely excited that we'll be able to look at the ice giants using the James Webb Space Telescope. So the UK has had a huge role in the Webb's construction, particularly the mid-infrared instrument. And I encourage you to go and have a look at the JWST UK website to find out more before the launch in October. The launch is currently set for October 31st, Halloween of this year, um, so look out for that. And uh, solar system science is an important but often forgotten aim of the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and you can find out more about the solar system and look out for exciting new science once Webb uh, launches uh, at the NASA Solar System website. And you can follow me on Twitter for updates on the ice giants and also the James Webb Space Telescope. Um, and thank you so much for having me. And uh, I'm really looking forward to your questions later.
I hope you all enjoyed Naomi's talk. I certainly did. And I'm very much looking forward to the launch of Web in just over five months, uh, really excitingly. I'm also absolutely delighted to actually welcome Naomi uh, to the festival today. Hello, thank you for joining us. Hello, lovely to be Hello. here. Um, so we've got a few questions for you, which have come in, which is ace. So if you do have any questions, uh, do pop them into the YouTube chat or you can send them to us at GSC1 on Twitter. Um, so we started off with what inspired you to study physics with astrophysics at university? Starting right at the beginning there. Yeah, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I was always interested in space from uh, being a small child. Like I went to a planetarium when I was a kid. And um, from then on, I was just obsessed with everything space. Um, so uh, at school, I loved all the sciences, um, but I wasn't very good at maths. Um, so I was tempted to just do um, the the less mathsy sciences because um, physics was my, my least uh, my my worst science basically but I loved it too much to to let it go so I decided you know what I'm going to do astrophysics at university and then I chose Leicester because um, physics with astrophysics um, meant that I could choose if I maybe didn't like astrophysics and, and actually I'm really glad that I did that because uh, I didn't enjoy astrophysics by the end I enjoyed planetary science a lot more so it's a good choice. Um delighted to hear that it was a planetarium that kind of set this uh, path yep. in motion <laughs> it was um, how could you not yeah. want to answer all those questions it's so I interesting know. It's, it's wonderful uh, i think we've got a wee question there from youtube there we go so derek says a great presentation i'm inclined to agree um with the jwst being so large to capture light in comparison to hubble how do you mitigate risk of any space debris so dust meteors etc colliding and damaging it oh that is a good question um I actually don't know the answer to that one. Um, I'm guessing that um, they take into account all of this and that the L2 Lagrange point is actually a good place to put it because it's this gravity well. So everything's quite stable in that mm -hmm. gravity well. Um, so that kind of minimizes the risk. But obviously there's always risk, even with um, astronauts being in space, there's always risk of, of debris and stuff. So the James Webb Space Telescope also has the same risk as them. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know they have to make the EVA suits bulletproof, like mm. literally for that exact reason. <laughs> um, let's see if we've got any more questions. There we go. So Abby, Abby has asked, you mentioned that Pluto has been captured by the Kuiper Belt. What does this mean? And have any other interesting objects been captured by the Kuiper Belt? So the Kuiper Belt um, itself is is like the asteroid belt. So it's just where all of these um, like rocks and debris have have. Um, accumulated and uh, so the planets have kind of tidied up their areas and um, there aren't any planets in those areas so so there's still rocks and stuff left behind um, so the Kuiper Belt uh, a Kuiper Belt object that we know of is Pluto because it's so big but there are also mm -hmm. loads of other Kuiper Belt objects um, uh, series and and all the 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 larger ones we have named but it's it's just like the asteroid belt it's extremely busy with loads of objects that are of interest to for us to look at and part of the reason some of those objects are part of the reason that pluto was reclassified when we we just found mm -hmm. out a bit more and had to kind of change our thinking about the solar system exactly because nobody wants to learn 20 different names for the planets in our solar system so nope <laughs> <laughs> it's much easier if you can chop it into little bits. It is, it is. It's a bit simpler to remember. Um, thanks for that question, Abby. I think we've got another wee one coming in. Oh, that's a good question from Derek. So what do you expect to see in more detail when looking at the ice giants? And are you expecting any surprises? Well, to be honest, we're, we're going to be looking at them kind of for the first time. We're going to be able to see them globally in these um, mid-infrared uh, wavelengths. So um, we're going to be seeing everything new. Uh, all of the science that comes in is going to answer um, a lot of the questions that we have. For example, my research is looking at how the uh, how Uranus changes as it spins um, mm -hmm. and also how Neptune changes as it spins. And uh, we don't know what causes that because we're just kind of guessing because we don't have any pictures to to look at uh, in these mid-infrared wavelengths. So um, when we get these pictures that also give us the information as to what's happening, we'll be able to say, OK, uh, this change as it's spinning is going to be is because of this specific area, the specific storm that we see is happening. So it's going to be really exciting to know what is going on and especially why Uranus and Neptune are so different. Hopefully we'll be able to at least get some clues as to why that's happening. That's really cool. 
Um, let's see what else have we got. Okay, so we're looking a wee bit further out here. So how will learning about our own solar system help us to understand the planets that we know for sure are orbiting other stars? Great question. Um, basically, we know very little about our uh, ice giants and some of the most uh, observed exoplanets that we've seen in other solar systems have been ice giant mass, uh, mm -hmm. so Neptune mass uh, planets. Uh, so we... If the, the more we know about our own Neptune, the more we know about the Neptunes of other solar systems. So why not use our our backyard to uh, to do experiments and find out more because we can't travel to those exoplanets to find out. So, um, yeah, we definitely want to travel to our own to, to figure out what's going on further away. That's pretty exciting. Mm. Um, let's see. Oh, there we go. So you mentioned you took a break from studying. So what was it that inspired you to go back to university and start a PhD? Um, I actually always wanted to do a PhD, um, it, mostly for selfish reasons. I wanted to be a doctor, Ro Gurney. <laughs> 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 Obviously, it's it. I, I do actually do want to do my PhD now, otherwise I wouldn't have got through it. But um, I took a break because I, I really struggled at university. It was really, really difficult um, academically. Mm -hmm. As I said, I struggled with maths as a as a kid. I struggled with maths all the way through, so um, uh, it was it was pretty hard to get through that. And then after doing like what twenty years of education, I was like, okay, I need a break. So I actually went to China uh, for an internship um, and ended up staying there accidentally for five years. So. <laughs> Um, and then uh, I actually, I found my love for physics again uh, after I fell out of love a little bit after university. Um, and uh, so I became a physics teacher at, towards the end of my China stay. Mm -hmm. And that really helped to to get me back on the, you know, ooh, let's, um, let's do physics again. Um, so, yeah. I can then, very much relate to that. <laughs> Yeah, right. Everybody needs a break sometimes. And it was mm -hmm. definitely worth it because I've really loved the PhD. And uh, I actually chose the uh, the PhD that I did because I've always loved weather and I always loved uh, astronomy. And mm -hmm. I thought I would have to pick between the two. Uh, but I just typed both into Google, you know, uh, <laughs> atmospheres and uh astronomy and it came up with planetary atmospheric science and I was like oh it's a thing people study the weather of other planets and um, I was hooked from there so I, I was looking around for planetary atmospheric physics stuff. That's, and yeah, given that the ice giants are mostly atmosphere I suppose you're, you've got a wealth of, of things you can look at there. <laughs> exactly exactly. Um, yeah I can very much relate I studied physics with astrophysics as well and had to take a break too because mm -hmm. sometimes you do you just want to kind of have a break from that so you can remember why you really like your subject exactly there we go we got there we go ah, that's quite a good one so what is the most surprising thing about what you do oh that's a good one most surprising thing um probably that uh it's not all just sitting and reading um, and being in front of a computer. Like I do, we before COVID, we used to do a lot of traveling and I really didn't expect to be doing so much traveling. So we traveled to conferences. Um, some of my colleagues traveled to telescopes. Unfortunately, my telescopes were all in space, so I can't travel to them, <laughs> <laughs> although I'd love to. <laughs> um, so yeah, it's really surprising to find out that you actually do a lot of like talking to other scientists and um, the collaboration part is a really exciting part rather than uh, the science part. Because you're, you're quite keen on public engagement as well. So is that something that you expected to be doing so much of during your PhD? Um, I, if you'd asked me that in university, I would have said no. But after um, do, being a teacher, I never expected to be a teacher, but I absolutely mm. loved it. It was it was fantastic um, being able to uh, yeah, communicate science to people who are interested in it. And um, science communication as for PhD students is like a huge thing. Like a lot of a lot of PhD students do it. And yeah, I would encourage more PhD students to do it because it's great fun. And it must be quite heartening as well to see people who maybe wouldn't engage with your research being able to engage with it and really understand why it's useful and why you're doing it yeah exactly right inspire some people to to take on science it's good <laughs> it's always good future scientists 
hopefully have a few more of those. Mm. Uh, I think we might have another one. Uh, have you made any amazing discoveries in your research so far? So what's the coolest thing you've found out? Ooh. Um, so I was talking about the, uh, so my research is mostly about how Uranus and Neptune spin and, mm. and what we what we find out uh, from one side to the other. So as it's turning, what's going on from the back of the planet, what's going on the, on the front of the planet. So uh, what we found was really interesting was that we expected Neptune to be more exciting, you know, have more changes, more dynamics going on because Neptune is um, a, a little bit hotter um, mm. because it has, uh, uh, so it has more weather going on and, and storms and, and things happening. But we found the opposite. We found that Uranus actually has more changes than Neptune. So it's it's slightly more dynamic in this specific instance, at least in 2007, um, 2007, 2005 time. Um, so that was really unexpected uh, thing to find. Uh, and uh, we still don't 100% know why that is, um, but it could just be that uh, because Uranus doesn't have many storms, we're seeing one big storm on one side. And then as it turns around, there's no storm on the other side. Whereas with Neptune, it might just be there's storms all over it. And so we're not seeing any changes happening there, but we, we really don't know. And we won't know until we get the James Webb Space Telescope. Which will hopefully be not before long. I think we've maybe got one more question. Here we go. There we go. So what's next for you? You're almost finished the PhD. So what are you planning to do next? Oh, so um, it's quite exciting. Um, I'm going to be working directly with the James Webb Space Telescope over at uh, NASA Goddard in, uh, in Maryland in the USA. I'm not allowed to officially announce this yet. So um, <laughs> don't go screaming about it. But um, yeah, it's really exciting. So I finished my PhD in October. October, well, uh, September, August, September time, and hopefully, <laughs> fingers crossed, I'm writing it now. We'll keep our fingers crossed for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, then after that, I'll be traveling over to the USA. So it's very exciting to be able to do that. I'm so going to be working with solar system science as well mm -hmm. over there. So same stuff that I talked about, I'll be talking about uh, at NASA as well. That's exciting. You get to continue your research in such a kind of wonderful place. Mm -hmm. Very exciting. Uh, Abby's asking, spaxels sound very cool. I think they do, I totally agree. Uh, can you tell us a bit more about those? Yeah, so um, it's not a new thing. So um, some uh, ground-based telescopes have have these abilities. So it's called an uh, IFU or an integrated field unit um, that's attached to the uh, telescope um, and then feeds into the uh, instruments. Uh, so this IFU, uh, it doesn't look as pretty as a uh, an image that you would get mm -hmm. from a, from an image camera. So it will be more pixelated. But if you imagine that each one of those pixels will have one of these amazing um, spectra in it, then it it becomes a lot more like the the information that it has means that it outweighs the fact that it's not quite as beautiful. <laughs> Which and I think that's fair, fair payoff. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's the stuff that um, I'm most interested in. At least my uh, field of science is most inter interested in. Um, and but obviously, James Webb also has the ability to take images um, and also spectra on their own as well. So it can do them both separately. But then this IFU thing is going to be the game changer for the ice giant specifically. Just being able to combine the, the spectra and the, the actual mm -hmm. nice images, which I'm sure we'll, we'll get to see as well. And mm -hmm. I'm sure people will enjoy too. Mm -hmm. um, well, that's, that's quite a big question. There we go. Um, so what advice would you give a young person? So say you were talking to a, a youth at your a fantastic public engagement event. What mm -hmm. would you advice would you give to a young person who's thinking about going on to study a STEM subject? What nudge would you give them to, to help them decide on that? I would say don't let anybody discourage you from doing it if it's what you really want to do. I had a lot of people tell me all throughout uh, school that maths, I should just not do maths. I should do the the foundation paper, you know, and I should um, I should think of something else other than physics to do at university because it probably is going to be too hard for me. Um, so I would definitely say don't listen to those people. You're, you're the only person who knows what you're capable of. And if you if you really enjoy it, you can definitely do it. So 
I would definitely say that. I like that. Yeah, do what you enjoy because otherwise you're not going to want to work as hard on it. Exactly, exactly. And physics, uh, doing physics at university uh, can open up so many different doors. It doesn't matter what you want to do in life. It's not like um, studying medicine where you have to be a doctor. Um, you can do anything you want after that. You can study something else. You can uh, go into industry. You can go into academia and do a PhD. You can go to China and, and waste five years and become a teacher. <laughs> You do anything you want. Yeah, you can end up managing planetariums. Like, that's, yeah. yeah, I would exactly. absolutely second that. Yeah, it really does open a lot of doors. Mm -hmm. um, have we got any other questions coming in? Oh, that's, yeah, so we're talking about international collaboration because you did mention it's quite a few space agencies that are involved mm -hmm. in web. How easy is it to work with so many other scientists on a project of this size? Um, so I'm quite low level in the James Webb Space Telescope, so I, I don't have to deal with um, managing people, but um, it's all very structured in the way they do it. So, um, for example, in the UK, we were very uh, focused on the MIRI instrument, which is the mid-infrared instrument. So um, the PI, so the, the the principal investigator, the person who's in charge, um, is uh, UK based for the MIRI instrument. And then th they're the person that uh, that decides what's going on and manages all of the uh, software people and the hardware people and all of the, the scientists surrounding that. And, and you know, you always have managers of, of different aspects. Um, I mean, the scientists are only just starting to to do proper proper things now mm -hmm. like doing modeling and and stuff like that because the james webb is obviously uh going to be launched soon very soon uh so yeah, yeah. so the, the lead pi is jillian wright isn't it she's yes. based in edinburgh so for anyone she is, who's she is. Uh, watching over in edinburgh uh, you've got quite a part to play in the web telescope <laughs> exactly and the yeah the uk atc where they are and um that does a lot of the software for for Miri, so they they're in collaboration with the Space Telescope Science Institute over in um, Baltimore in the USA. So they have a lot of back and forth between each other. So there's loads of people constantly talking to each other. But I suppose that's with any any industry, you have a lot of collaboration like that. Yeah, so communication, I suppose, is always the yeah. most important thing. Mm -hmm. Smashing stuff. So we're on to the last couple of questions. Let's see, so. The janitor has asked, what's the next steps after the JWST? What more would you like to be able to see and analyse out there? So obviously the next step after James Webb for the Ice Giants is a mission. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be the, the next thing we need to do. I mean, we literally have not been to the Ice Giants uh, for more than a flyby. Like this one uh, Voyager 2, when it went past, it literally just flew past both of them um, really quickly. And that's where when you think of the pictures of Uranus and Neptune, uh, they're almost always the pictures that we got yes. from the, the Voyager 2 flyby. And that was in uh, 1986 and 1989. And I, I wasn't even alive then. <laughs> <laughs> so um, that's like a, a really uh, a long time ago. Mm -hmm. um, so yeah, a mission there, uh, being able to drop a probe into one of them, that would be really amazing uh, to be able to, because all we can see with uh, telescopes with remote sensing is uh, chemicals reacting with other chemicals we can't see the chemicals that don't react with anything so um, uh, any of the uh, the noble gases we won't be able to see any any of those things from from where we are so we need to drop some kind of probe to be able to get a full picture of what's happening in those atmospheres that's, yeah, oh, I mean, I would be super excited to have a, a mission out there because although the, the pictures from Voyager 2 are they're beautiful and they have been useful, one more really would would like yeah, more information. Right. Exactly. <laughs> Why not? We need to go there. We've been we've been to Jupiter. We've been to Saturn. We've been to Mars so many times. Yeah, uh, yeah. Totally recently. <laughs> yeah. So the next step is a hundred percent ice giant mission. Either one of them or both of them I don't mind everybody always asks me would I like to go to Uranus would I like to go to Neptune um I really don't I don't care one any I know because that was that was the thing Voyager had the advantage of, of kind of everything just being in that perfect alignment at that yeah. time the, yeah. the sort of grand tour was it called yes I yeah. think but yeah so we're I have to wait a while for the next next one of those but yeah I think I think just either one just pick one and go pick one and go for it yeah I agree. Nice. 
Um, it's another one from Derek. So he's asking, Hubble changed how people saw the solar system and the universe. Um, again, I would totally agree with that. Uh, so how soon will the public see images from JWST after it's launched? Um, so it takes uh, a few months for everything to get sorted. Um, if it gets launched on time in uh, October and there's no weather issues or whatever, it should be uh, sending back first science um, or we should be releasing first science mm -hmm. around May. So around this time next year, I think will be That's the first really time. Soon. First science uh, discoveries will be released. I'm, I'm sure um, knowing NASA, they'll have some exciting things to announce before then because um, they're very good at that kind of thing. So. Yeah, I would say look out anytime in 2022. There's going to be there's going to be stuff to look at. So, fingers crossed. It's pretty mm. exciting. Um, so we've got a couple more questions. Uh, so would you like to actually go to space and see any of the planets for yourself? I would love to. Um, the the ESA call for astronauts. Mm -hmm. I'm definitely um, that get that's on the 28th. That the uh, the deadline is i'm yeah. i'm definitely applying to that so i would like to go to space i, I wouldn't <laughs> lie the chance to be an astronaut is a chance in a lifetime so of course it's pretty cool um i've not applied to the, the esa astronaut thing i don't like flying let alone oh, okay starts it off a rocket so but yeah you're braver than me <laughs> <laughs> um so we've got one more question coming in there uh, so who inspires you Oh, that's a good one. Lots of women inspire me. Um, my mum, especially, she's a uh, an IT uh, person in IT. So, and my auntie did a physics degree and writes uh, science uh, marketing stuff. So, um, yes, yeah, so I've got a lot of, um, especially black women role models in my life that do um, STEM subjects. So that's really exciting. Um, uh, other people who inspire me are um, Maggie Adderin Pocock. She mm -hmm. is an absolute legend. I talk about her all the time, so she probably thinks that I'm a massive stalker. But you know, <laughs> hi, hi, Maggie. <laughs> She's great, a real inspiration. So, and so it's nice that you've got that kind of link to physics within your own family as well, and to have that encouragement, I guess, from your family too must make a, a huge difference. Exactly, they're very enthusiastic. They're always um, like my grandpa the other day. He read my paper and actually asked some some questions about it. So I'm like, wow, he's like he's 95. He's Were you able to answer them? More importantly, uh, one really. of them was actually a very difficult question. So you know, good on him. <laughs> That's pretty impressive. That's wonderful. And yeah, really nice to see that you are now inspiring people watching, hopefully the young people. Uh, so yes, yeah, so. hopefully some future future scientists, people using web uh, in the future. So I think I'm just going to check with our lovely producer. I think that's it for the questions. Um, so it's just up, for, up to me to say a massive thank you for joining us today and, and for uh, that great talk. Um, and to say thank you to everyone who's watching for joining us. Um, Thank you so much and we'll see you later. Bye. Thank you. Bye.